Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni muliwanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jadley and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so honored that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Donna Washington. She is here to celebrate Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa and tell us all about this beautiful holiday. Before we invite Donna into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Field Trip to the Farm, the latest in Mr. Shipman's Kindergarten Chronicle series. We love this book. Atlanta's favorite teacher, Dr. Terrence Shipman, is back with a brand new addition to his Kindergarten Chronicles. It's called Field Trip to the Farm. Do you remember how excited you were when you were in elementary school and kindergarten when you went on a field trip? Field trip to the farm reminds us of those really, really happy times. This is the fifth book in the Kindergarten Chronicle series, and this time our class explores the wonders of Ramsey Farm on their field trip. It is a super entertaining story that your kids will absolutely love, and it reminds us all of the wonder and excitement of kindergarten. Field Trip to the Farm, the latest in Mr. Shipman's Kindergarten Chronicles. Joining us right now from Durham and the beautiful state of North Carolina, our guest today is here to... Help us celebrate the holiday of Kwanzaa. She is the author of Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa and the story of Kwanzaa. Please welcome to the show, Donna Washington. Hey, Donna, how are you? I am fine. Thank you so much for having me today. Happy Kwanzaa. Well, thank you. Happy Kwanzaa to you as well. Thank you very much. You know, this is a, um, a holiday that I'm very familiar with the name but not so much familiar with the traditions and the origins. And, and I think that that's probably the case for a lot of people. Can you tell us a little bit about the holiday? Well, Kwanzaa is actually considered a festival. Okay. Because it takes place over the course of seven days after Christmas. So it starts on December 26th and goes until January 1st. And the origins of it are more recent than a lot of the other festivals and holidays that we celebrate in America. Um, In the 60s, a man named Milana Karenge was noticing that even though we have festivals that are based on traditions from other parts of the world, there was no national festival based on the traditions of the African immigrants that were here, the ancestors uh, of those who came here from Africa. So he basically pulled on different traditions from around the diaspora and in Western Africa, and also tweak things here and there that are a little American. Mm -hmm. And he put together Kwanzaa. And so Kwanzaa is a celebration of community. So after we've had our celebration of of, uh, Christmas and Hanukkah is usually over by this point and Ramadan, there's a whole lot of festivals of lights that happen at this point in the year. And that's mostly because, you know, the people um, are de- going into the darkest part of the year. So mm-hmm. all over the world, uh, in the northern hemisphere anyway, <laughs> people had lights, they had candles and lights, and, and it's to bring back the sun and to, to sort of gather together. So Kwanzaa is a, is a festival of lights where we gather together. We tell stories that come out of the African and the African-American tradition. We do activities that are for building the community the idea that you leave your community a more wholesome, a better or more beautiful and a more cohesive place. So um, during Kwanzaa, um, every morning we get up, we light the the Kinara, which is the candle labra. And the each day has a different name in Swahili. Um, He chose Swahili because it's spoken all over the African world. And then each day has a theme, right? So my favorite one is Kuji Chagulia. 
which means self-determination. It means that you determine for yourself who you are and what you do, and you don't let anybody else tell you who you are. And um, there are other days where you do Ujima or Ujama, which is uh, working in the community or uh, spending money in businesses that are part of the community. So we volunteer um, on the day that is um, community involvement. Um, sometimes we donate food to food banks. Sometimes we serve people. Sometimes we work in animal shelters. And then on the day when you're supposed to do cooperative work and economics, we go and patronize um, community uh, uh, businesses. So not not big box stores like we don't go to Target. <laughs> that's not the day to go to Target. That's the day to go to the, the small store that's in your community. And when uh, Milano Karenga originally created this festival, it was very much centered on African-American um, businesses, which um, there were a lot of them. And so the idea is to be aware of where those businesses are in your community and go and patronize those and make sure that you are spending money in your community that will come back to your community and not go out to larger corporations that aren't part of your community. Yeah. And also, too, and then on like the day for um, creating art, there's a day where you're supposed to create art. The idea is that you leave that art in your community. It can be like a performance. It can be music. It can be painting, storytelling, all of these things to bring us together and help us recognize how we're all part of each other. And that really is what Kwanzaa is about. And that's beautiful. All of those activities to, to remind us that we're connected and part of a beautiful human family. That's, uh, it, it certainly is something that I want to be mindful of when I'm celebrating Christmas or when I'm celebrating Thanksgiving. It's, uh, I think Kwanzaa is in, in those ideals. I, I think that's something that we should all be celebrating. Well, I think that's why it's, it's catching on the longer it exists mm -hmm. <laughs> and people are becoming more aware of it. Because, you know, between December, the end of December and January, uh, normally schools are still closed. Mm -hmm. You're still with your family. People are still traveling. And um, when my family travels, we take our canara with us, which is, you know, the, the candelabra. And you put the, the candles in. And each day we light the, the candle. And um, typically what we do is we tell a short story based on the idea of the day. Whatever the idea of the day is, we tell a short story. And then we have an activity as a family that, you know, embodies that particular day. And you can, there are cities that have whole festivals, right, where you can come and there's an entire day, there's music, there's dancing. Uh, and then, of course, you have the big fest, the big feast of Kwanzaa, where you should eat food that come from different, that are celebrated in the African-American community. Um, and if you don't know what those are, this is a great time to get cookbooks. Carla Hall has some great cookbooks out. <laughs> um, different, different cookbooks that will have, great recipes for families um, that you can prepare together and you, you eat black eyed peas because those are for luck. And you, you, you make little cakes called Benny cakes with sesame seeds and sesame seeds are also for luck in the new year. So there's just lots of little things and it's just, it's a really fun holiday or festival yeah. to celebrate. Now, is it, you know, one of the words that we hear, phrases that we hear is this idea of cultural appropriation. Is it appropriate for me and for my family to celebrate Kwanzaa? Yes. I think everyone should celebrate it. <laughs> um, the thing about a cultural festival is that every big holiday that we celebrate in our country was at one point cultural somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the only a small group of people celebrated it. And the only way festivals and holidays survive is if they become more widely accepted. There isn't any reason why if you live in a community where that, that is not diverse, that you don't actually have any minority businesses in your area and you don't want to drive 40 miles to go, you know, <laughs> patronize one. You can still look around your community and see where are the small stores where are the stores that are owned by the people in your community? What can you do in your community that would make your community better? Um, do you need? Do you want to go and uh, work at um, the the homeless uh, ser uh, center um, mm -hmm. to serve food? Do you have things you want to donate? Do you have 
I don't know, you're going to go and work at the animal shelter. There are all sorts of things in your community where people need help or that you, as someone who may not ever need any of those services, should still be aware of what they are. And it also means that you're aware of all the people in your community, not just the people you live around. Mm. I think that that is a really profound and really important thing for all of us to be aware of. You know, because it's really, I started noticing this when, when I started to approach being 100 years old. I, I, I started to realize that I could walk into a group of teenagers, and unless one of them knew me beforehand, I was invisible. You know, mm-hmm. if I was just, if there was just a group of teenagers in a store or whatever, and I walked in, they didn't see me <laughs> at all. They weren't aware <laughs> of me. And, and I have a feeling, unfortunately, that there's uh, there are people in, in my life that I don't see and and I need to train myself and we need to ha- help our kids understand that we need to make the effort to see everybody that's around us right and i think that when we when we talk about cult- cultural appropriation mm-hmm. which I, which is a very good thing to bring up because that is a big thing that people are talking about right now i think what we're really kind of concerned about is cultural misappropriation mm. And that's where you take something out of a culture and then you twist it or change it so that it doesn't resemble anything that has to do with that culture. And then you use it for something else. Mm -hmm. So an example of that would be, um, well, like, for instance, in Native American culture, Mm -hmm. where the the most honored person in the in the community would have one of those beautiful headdresses Mm -hmm. and they're. That is something that is very much part of that culture. If you take that symbol and then you do something with it to make money or you do something with it to, I don't know, like I I saw one really kind of cringy (laughs) uh, picture of like a model, like one of those really skinny, skinny models. Mm -hmm. And she was wearing barely like really, really short skirt and like crop top. And she had on one of these gorgeous headdresses which is really not an okay thing mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. So that is where you have taken a symbol and taken it out of the culture. And then because it's pretty or because you like it, you did something with it. Um, and it's actually disrespectful mm-hmm. to that culture. Mm-hmm. This uh, Kwanzaa grew out of a need for African-American cultures or, or um, communities in this country to have something to hold them together. Um, historically, African-American communities have had a lot of strife um, in terms of trying to not be separated. Like, you know, when they built the highways, they put, built highways between some of those neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. So this movement to make, to create Kwanzaa was really about bringing us together and making us see each other. Mm-hmm. And that was such a huge problem in the, well, even now today, I guess, sure. in many ways, mm-hmm. but definitely in the 60s, there was a lot of fighting for civil rights and the right to be seen and heard. And it's not just a problem in African-American communities. As you said, different age groups even don't see each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember being at university. Do you remember being at university or in school? It's hard. And I was yeah. always surrounded by 20-year-olds. <laughs> This is the only thing I ever saw. And then I graduated from university. I was like, look at all these children. Where did all these children come from? Were there always children here? <laughs> so we do. We section ourselves off based on what we're doing in life or how old we are or where we live. And Kwanzaa is a time where you take the blinders off and you look around and you see everybody and you ask yourself the simple question, where do I fit in my community? Help my community. I love that. Where do I fit in my community? How can I help my community? That's such a beautiful, be- beautiful set of questions to ask ourselves and to help our kids ask themselves and to help our kids answer. Um, tell us how reading the story of Kwanzaa and Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa can help families um, do just that. Well, the the thing about this, uh, the oldest one, I'll show you really quickly, the story of Kwanzaa. The thing about the story of Kwanzaa, I know, no one can see it. I'm just holding it up. <laughs> the thing about the story of Kwanzaa is that it is 
it is for a slightly older audience, like you, you know, third, fourth grade, but it explains it. Mm-hmm. It straight up explains what all the symbols are, explains why the holiday exists. It is a nonfiction book. And if you wanted to learn about Kwanzaa, then it would be great to like read part of it every night over the course of the festival. And then by the end of the book, you would have a really good sense of why we do what we do and um, or what, what Kwanzaa is all about. And within that book, you have recipes and crafts and just various sections that explain what you do. Mm-hmm. The story, Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa, the picture book. The best thing about it is you don't need to know anything about Kwanzaa to enjoy that book. <laughs> and by the time you're done, you'll get a sense of it. Um, Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa is about a little rabbit who doesn't like Kwanzaa because it's complicated. Uh. All the days are in Swahili. And you, you do these things. You make Zwadi, which are little presents. Only he's the littlest rabbit uh-huh. and his presents don't look good. So he's always ashamed to share them with people. And the only thing he likes about Kwanzaa is the caramu, which is like the big dinner at the end of Kwanzaa. It's like the Christmas dinner. or So it's huge, right? But the person who makes it is his grandmother, and she is not well. Mm. So then he's like, who is going to cook? Who will cook if my grandmother is unwell? And he asks his mother, and she's like, really? Your grandmother is sick, and all you're worried about is eating? You go outside and play. So... He goes outside and he gets this idea. He is going to make caramu. He's going to do it himself. And off he goes. And as he goes through the the meadow, he encounters his neighbors and they ask him where he's going. And he says, oh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to make a zwadi for my grandma. She's not well. And off he goes. And his neighbors are, oh, they didn't know what a zwadi was. They didn't know what caramu was. They had no idea what Kwanzaa is, but they know his grandmother. And his grandmother makes toys for the little kids when they get you know, grumpy, and she helps them, like, make little boats. And when gra- Grandpa, squ- Papa Squirrel loses his nuts after she's helped them hide them, she remembers where they are and helps them dig them up in the spring. So she is she embodies all the things of Kwanzaa. And by the end of the day, Little Rabbit is really kind of bummed because he cannot find anything. And his attitude is, I am the littlest rabbit. I cannot do anything. And he goes home, and there's a big party at his house. Because everyone who heard about his grandmother decided they were going to do something to help. And so the frogs are there and they're singing and they brought like lanterns, leaf pad lanterns and the crickets have come. They're playing music and, and all the animals have come and the birds have come and everyone brought food. And so they're all together and they're sharing. And, and after it's over, Lil Rabbit is really upset. <laughs> his grandmother said, what is wrong with you? We just had the best care move ever. What happened? And he was like, I was the only one who wanted to do something. And I'm the only one who didn't do anything. Everyone else brought everything and I didn't do anything. And his grandmother says, you had a dream and you took your dream out and shared it with everybody. And the dream brought everybody here tonight. You did the biggest thing of all. And that's his Kuji Chagulia, his self-determination. And she says, you did a huge thing. And he says, wow, I didn't realize it was that big. And she said, of course it is, because I have faith in you. That's it's just sweet. a really sweet story. That is beautiful. I love that. What a – I'm I'm imagining back 20, 29 years ago when my kids were still sitting on my laps, that would have been such a fun, beautiful story to share. Talk about helping – your kids get a sense of empowerment and, and, and understanding that even no matter how small they are, mm-hmm. that they're actually in, in, in the case I, that there were so many people in my family who came back to the family because my son was baptized. And that's the first time they, they'd spoken together in decades. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so, so beautiful. I'm, Oh, wow. You know, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm thinking if if my kids were four or five again, I think one of the things that I would want to do is just to go out and celebrate every single holiday festival I could. We'd be partying all year long. (laughs) But beyond that, we'd be giving our kids a very concrete 
and very we're always talking about you know uh being in the present and you know uh helping our kids be intentional what better way to help our kids be intentional than to to celebrate and to celebrate each other and celebrate our communities yeah well, I think that's exactly the point of Kwanzaa, mm-hmm. that we – it's not just that we're thinking about everybody, which is nice, mm-hmm. <laughs> but we're actually doing something. Um, uh, Kwanzaa is like um, – it's, I, 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 it's a civil rights festival. I mean, there's really another, no other way to think about it. It was built with that mindset that you – it's an interactive festival. You go out to get your hands dirty. You, know, <laughs> you go out and you find people. Um, Whether it's, you know, um, like one of the things we have here in Durham is we have a huge, it's not really a store, but it sort of acts like a store and it has, it has uh, baby supplies. Mm -hmm. So if you're uh, a mother and you can't afford to buy formula and you can't afford diapers, there's this place you can go where you push your buggy through, (laughs) you, you know, you gather stuff like you're shopping Mm -hmm. um, and then you don't. Uh, have to pay for that. Um, it's a way to have dignity even when things are really difficult. And it's not a question of getting a handout. It's a question of what is a human need. Mm-hmm. And so um, we donate to that particular organization. And, you know, during Kwanzaa, we actually physically go, because normally we send the money mm-hmm. because they know what they need. <laughs> during during uh, Kwanzaa, we call and ask what it is we can bring. And we personally go out to the stores buy the the things and bring them um, to the center. So there are things like that, that we take the extra step so that we can actually see those things. Mm-hmm. And our kids, it really had a huge impact on our kids. Um, my son is 25 and my daughter is 22. And they are still, um, well, you know what? They, they're still really active in their communities and they still give back. But here's something that we got. That we got because of Kwanzaa, but was great all year. Something called the Money Savvy Pig. The Money Savvy Pig. Uh, I am intrigued. It is a piggy bank with sections. So one section is for spending. One section is for investing. And one section is for donations. Mm. And so you can open each section individually. And whenever we gave them their allowance, we would... You know, we would tell them, you have to put money in the investing. You always should do that. You can decide how much you want to put in donation and how much you want to put in spending. And then at uh, twice a year, they would open their their donations, and we would uh, match or go up to $100 for whatever they have in there. And then they would personally go and do their donations, whether they donated. And they could choose whatever they wanted to donate to. So at Quanta time was the second time that they opened it and did their donations. And it, like I said, it made a big difference in terms of how they even think about what money does mm-hmm. and what it's for. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I, and I love that idea of the kids having a piggy bank where they're intentionally placing this is for spending, this is for investing. Boy, if only people started thinking about investing <laughs> at an early age. And, and 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 this is for giving back to the community. And I think mm-hmm. that that's uh, so so wise. We've talked about teaching our kids financial literacy on, on the show so much. It's it, it's it's something that's so important, but it's something that we really don't um, spend a lot of time talking to our kids about. Um, so what what a beautiful idea to share with our audience today. I you know I'm. I, I love the story of, of Little, Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa. I have a feeling that there's a lot more stories that Donna Washington has shared with the world. Where can, where can we go to find them? Well, um, if you want to watch me tell a story, you can go to YouTube and type Donna Washington Storyteller into the box, and I will tell you hours worth of stories over there. Um, some on my channel, most of them are people who've like surreptitiously videotaped uh-huh. me while I'm performing <laughs> and then uploaded the video later. Um, I also uh, live on the internet at dlwstoryteller.com. And that's my website. And you can find out more about me than you ever wanted to know, <laughs> including the books I have out. And I have, um, gosh, 13 recording albums. Of stories. 
Wow. So you you can get MP4s on Amazon and Spotify. So all of all of the stories that I tell are there. I don't sing. So all of my recordings are spoken word recordings. Mm-hmm. Um, and I visit. You know, you you have gotten out of the visiting schools game. Um, but I am still, I still, I travel all over the world and tell people stories. And a lot of times in the summertime, I'm in libraries at all over the country. Yeah. So you have a chance to run into me. Yeah. So we're, we're looking forward to it. And I want to extend an invitation to have you come back in the future to talk more about your MP3s and your storytelling and your other books. All right. Sounds great. We've had a great time speaking uh, to the author of Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa and the story of Kwanzaa, Donna Washington. Donna, thank you for helping us celebrate this beautiful festival. Well, Jen, thank you so much for inviting me. This has been wonderful. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Janet Fox. She'll be here to celebrate her early middle grade novel. It's called Carry Me Home. And it's a great book that can spark conversations about homelessness, how we can help folks who are unhoused, and how we can talk about becoming the community that we aspire to be. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Hey, if you're the author of a fantastic children's book, you may be frustrated at just how hard it is to let the world know about your book. You know, there are literally thousands of books published every single month. Surprising, huh? Every single month, there are thousands of new books that are introduced to the world. It's really hard for a book to stand out in that crowd. We would love to help you. There are so many ways Reading With Your Kids podcast can help celebrate your book. You can be a guest on the podcast. Being a guest, it's fun. It's easy. It gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. And it doesn't cost a thing. You can also submit your book to our Certified Great Read panel. If they believe that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a Certified Great Read. And with that status comes a whole lot of of really powerful tools to let parents know that your book is worthy of their consideration. And you can also take part in our monthly promotion program, which will celebrate your book through commercials on the podcast, messages to our 62,000 plus social media followers. It's like growing every day by leaps and bounds. And also, we'll have your book displayed on our nationwide network of digital pedestrian billboards. You can learn all about these great programs by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page and scroll on down to our various services. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, I want to thank our sponsor, Dr. Terrence Shipman. Be sure to check out the field trip to the farm, the latest in Mr. Shipman's Kindergarten Chronicle series. I also want to thank our, give a big thanks to our guest, Donna Washington. Be sure to check out Little Rabbit's Kwanzaa and the story of Kwanzaa and really think about adding this holiday to your family list of celebrations. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, beautiful holiday and I think it's a great way for us to build those communities and to celebrate the wonders and all the blessings in our lives. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.